Last week we talked about keeping Colorado free and open and how we had to stand up against the Great Reset, which the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab is promoting, and what is riding on the heels of COVID-19 uh, as an opportunity that they see to do this Great Reset. This week we're going to talk about the fact that as communities, we need to resist this, and to do that we have to become resilient communities that can almost be self-sufficient. And so we're going to talk about uh, that a little bit today. We're going to follow it up in the future with some specific classes and uh, actions that you can take to increase your resilience in the community. So let's talk about how to build a thriving community, and we'll just do this as an opening. It'll be followed by a second video which gets into more specifics. So we're going to talk about how do you get started uh, and the fact that uh, the beginning of everything is getting educated. You need to know what the Great Reset is all about, which was the other video that we cut. But you also need to know how do you create a resilient community. And this will take some kind of research on your part. Uh, you need to take steps to change your lifestyle because resilience is kind of dependent upon three, step level, three legs of the stool which is your economic, ecological, and your social legs, which encompass all the things that make your community resilient. And you need to take steps to, uh, to enact projects. Once you figure out what it is that uh, you need to do, then you need to rally your community behind the projects that are important. Prioritize those, know what kind of, uh, you know, what kind of skills and talents you have within your community and put them to work to build that that dream or that model that you're working for. So what we're doing here is we're actually building a movement. We're building a movement away from being controlled by the government to one of self-sufficiency at the community level. And we're going to have to shift some systems and we're going to have to address some of those that exist. In other words, we may have to rewrite some of the uh, policies and some of the rules and regulations that we work under now so that if we go forward into the future, they actually support the resilient community you're trying to build. So let's get started. One of the ways you're going to get started is that, you know, everything can be found online these days. I mean, if you want to know something, you just say, hey, how do you do X or how do you do Y? You go online and boom, somebody's either cut a video on it or they've got some kind of a report on it or some manual that you can read. Almost free, most of the time free, uh, and generally in enough detail that you can actually make them work. The other thing you need to do or can do is that there are free publications and films out there that you can watch uh, which will pretty much take you on step by step how to uh, do whatever task it is that you're trying to learn. And once you've got that, we do it uh, in the military, we had a thing called train the trainer. And here in the community, what we need to do is train the community. So you have two or three people, uh, divide up what it is you need to do, uh, and they can heavily research those areas. And then you pull together some kind of a training event, a webinar, or, or some kind of event that where you have the people come in, and you train them from what you learned and that's called train the trainer and it works really well uh, as you impart knowledge down to the community. So now that you've gotten started and you've got some education behind you about what it is you need to do and uh, what areas you'd like to change and what projects you'd like to take on, you're going to have to look at some of the lifestyles you're going to change and, and indeed all of us can change our lifestyles a little bit to become more resilient and to better use the resources that we have. First off, you, if you're building a community you got to build it from the ground up and the community is made up of people so you need to go out and meet your neighbors you know it's, it's amazing these days especially after we've gone through this lockdown how so many uh, people have been disconnected and literally they've been isolated you're isolated almost from your neighbor uh, you know who's living right next door you haven't seen him maybe in six to nine months uh, so get to know these these people invite them over for dinner you know springtime comes have a barbecue you know that's fine and if it goes against the community standards, or I should say the government standards of social distancing, so be it. Get to know your community, get to know each other, and reestablish those relationships. You know, and as you're doing that, uh, once again, like I said, uh, some of the things to make you resilient is obviously your food system. You've got a backyard, maybe it's all in grass. Well, does it have to all be in grass? 
maybe a smart thing to do is to get out there and turn some of it into a garden or go somewhere and, and be, get a community garden started. You know, I lived in Germany for a long time and outside the cities, they literally had all these garden plots. I mean, it was great. You'd go out there and they had the little cabins and they had, everybody had their little garden and that's where they spent the time on the weekends a lot of time it was just out in those garden plots you know, enjoying themselves, working on their garden, uh, and creating food for the, for the table. And that's an important thing, and it, it literally helps with your, uh, with your budget, but it also gives you good, nutrient-dense food that you have a great feeling of satisfaction for, because after all, you raised it. If you've got a talent uh, that you'd like to share, that's another way of building resilience. Uh, if you're a carpenter and would like to share your skills with somebody, do that. You know, if you're a uh, CPA, and work with finances. Do that. Maybe if you're like me, you know, have some kind of uh, background in video production, you can go out and help people promote their businesses by cutting a video for them. So there's lots of sharing that can be done, and we'll talk about that a little later, some of the values of that, as we get on down this, pres this presentation. You know, the other thing we need to do, and once again, I keep using Europe as a model, but, you know, it seems like they've been ahead of us for a while, but after all, they've been in countries over there for a lot longer than we have is you've got to learn to recycle. Resources are not infinite. As much as people like to say, well, you know, we're not going to run out of it in my lifetime. Well, you just might. So, recycle where you can. Cut down on resource usage. Uh, you know, have collection points for things like newspapers and magazines and glass. Just recycle those things and, and it's amazing these days if you kind of look at some of the stuff that you that you buy how much of it now is is actually recycled plastics and petroleum products so it's very wise to recycle those things that you use so that uh, we don't use up our resources too fast also keep wealth within the community and you say how do you do that well spend your money with your local your local community uh, businessman don't go driving down and giving your money away to Walmart and King Supers and all these great big businesses. If you got a small business just around the corner that's going to provide the same product or a product that's similar, maybe even at a little higher price, you know, go ahead and spend it there because that guy's your neighbor. And when he spends his money, you want to encourage him to spend his money in your business or for something that you support. And it, uh, it tends to build cohesion within the community and keeps the dollars flowing there. Another way you can save money and make a, a community a little more resilient is, is look at your energy usage and start right there at the home. I mean, a lot of things start right there at the home. Uh, so, is your house well insulated? Would increasing the insulation factor in your roof uh, cut down on the amount of energy you have to use? You know, uh, get energy efficient appliances when you buy things. It's got a little tag on it that says energy efficient. That's the one you should buy versus the other one. The other thing we need to do is, uh, is conserve water. Here in Colorado, water is a big deal. I mean, uh, literally when we look at buying places, one of the first things I do is go, what's the water source? And is there any restrictions on it? The other thing I think about is the fact that, you know, I've had three daughters and uh, I learned real early in my life that I wanted to be the first one into using the shower because by the time you were the last one in behind them, maybe there wasn't any hot water left. So, cut down on the length of showers you take. You don't need to be in there all day. Go in. It's not just to, uh, to uh, become sign of a, uh, a luxury that you, you exploit. Literally get in, get out, uh, and save the water, and save the electricity it takes to heat that water for your usage. You know, the other, the other area you can look at, and I did this a lot once again when I was in Europe, but also when I was growing up. You know, if, you're, if you only lived a mile from, from where you worked, it's very easy to go green with your uh, with your transportation. Go out, get on your bicycle, and ride a bike. I mean, it saves on energy. It also helps you uh, get some fresh air and some exercise, and get and that's that's all good for you. I mean, that's always good for you. Now, if you've got public transit, take it. Or if you can arrange a carpool, that's always a good thing too. I worked outside of Washington D.C. There as a Beltway Bandit for years, and. Uh, that was, a, that was the way people got to work a lot of times, and they'd done that the whole time they'd worked there, is they'd gone out and, and carpooled in and out of Washington, D.C. from the suburbs. And lastly, like I said before, build that inner resistance. And how do you do that? You forge relationships with your neighbors. 
Once you've got that part going there, you may identify some projects within each one of these areas that you want to do. You know, economically, a community now is kind of, and has for years, relied upon, uh, you know, your big banks, Wells Fargo and Chase and all that. That's not who you want to rely on. You want to rely on small banks. Once again, that's in the vein of keeping the money within your, your community. But if you've got money just sitting in the bank, then it's not working for you. So one of the things you can do is, uh, there's a term out there called slow money. In other words, you don't need your return quite as fast as it would have been in the bank anyway. And if you could take it out of the bank and there's a project that somebody needs and he needs money to do it, and he's willing to pay you a percentage of that, just like being a bank, you'll probably make a higher percentage lending him the money and supporting his project than having your bank money sit in a bank making minimal interest. And sometimes, I mean, uh, there are some banks that even charge you to look after your money. Can you believe that? So, uh, you know, slow money is the way to go. There's another thing out there that's called Time Bank. It's where you trade your skills uh, and you put it in to help somebody and somebody logs that in, the uh, amount of time that you used your skills. And then when you need something, you find somebody that say you need a carpenter and he's willing to volunteer his time to help you. And it all works up back and forth. It's kind of a time barter system for the use of other people's skills. And it works really good in a small community. Once again, if you're doing, uh, if you're doing energy uh, and you're looking at energy, uh, a, lot of your, a lot of your states and counties have programs that will actually help you uh, put in energy efficient solar systems and those types of things. So you have a better use of energy within the community, whether it be uh, hydroelectric or, or windmills. I mean, I've seen people that have put uh, small wind turbines up on their houses and generated electricity. Some people generated enough electricity, they actually have sold electricity back to the major companies, which is a wise, way to, wise action and a smart thing to do, and it makes your community more resilient. Lastly, once again, food. Food's part of your Maslow hierarchy of needs. I mean, we all like to eat well, uh, so get to know your local farmer and support him. Uh, here later on, I will put out a class on how to start up and run a co-op there in Moscow, Idaho, where I was the vice president of the co-op, we got so that we used, uh, we probably got 40% of the produce that we sold and a lot of the meat products, the beef and the pork and the chickens, all came from local farmers. They had pretty much a guaranteed uh, market for their product at a reasonable price and that supported the whole community by keeping the economic flow once again within the community. Lastly, you got a community that you need to take care of and be part of. And to do that, you don't always, you don't always want to just be working together. You got to learn to play together and have events that everybody can come out and enjoy the fact that you are a community and you are a successful community because of the actions you've taken. So don't be afraid to get together. Uh, churches are doing that right now and have throughout the ages. But we need to see communities do that and support your neighbors uh, on a daily basis. You know, we are the people. We the people have inalienable, right, inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What I'm talking about here and have been talking about is a movement, a movement away from the government that over this last year, 2020, which has been a horrendous year, uh, has imposed numerous restrictions on you and told you what you can and can't do, whether legally or illegally. We need to stand up to that and we need to move forward and have a resilient community, even if, when and if this goes away in the near future, so that we will not be caught short again and let this happen. We want to be as self-sufficient as possible as we move forward. Shifting the system that we're talking about is going to require knowing the laws, but also possibly rewriting them. At one point, I helped rewrite laws for farming in 11 states and testified in front of the, uh, the state legislature in Virginia to get the cottage bills done. Get familiar with them, work with the people who, who run some of your rules and regulations, and if they're not working or they are too restrictive or they're not conducive to having a resilient community, then see what you can do to propose new bills and rewrite existing laws into better laws that'll help you into the future to be resilient. Lastly, you know, 
I've got a statement here from it's like Forrest Gump. Community is as a community does. If you want something to happen, you've got to get out and make it happen. It isn't going to happen just by you going, wow, I wish we didn't have to do this, or I wish things were different. Things are not going to get different unless you get involved with your neighbor and take action. So there's a resilient cycle here. I've got it displayed. Uh, know it, work it, do it, uh, you know, and start out by mapping and knowing who your neighbors are, what their skills are, and how they can be employed to help facilitate and make that movement a reality to become a resilient community within your state uh, and be able to be resilient into the future. So we will all enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness.